Different cells divide at different rates. Bacterial cells, prokaryotic cells in general, divide fairly frequently, sometimes as often as every 20 minutes. That means a doubling time of 20 minutes. We'll take a look at that briefly in this module, and then we'll spend most of the time introducing the eukaryotic cell cycle and how it differs from generation of new cells in bacteria. Really, we're asking when in the life of a cell does DNA synthesis occur? Prokaryotes exhibit basically continuous replication, and we can see this in dividing bacterial cells. If you place a few cells in a liquid culture, here's what you would see if you followed growth over time. So we're going to count the number of cells and plot that on the y-axis at different times. And here's the S-shaped curve that we get, which is very characteristic of cell growth in general. In bacteria, we refer to the period of time when doubling seems to be fairly infrequent as the lag phase. It is followed by a period of time when the cells double very frequently, and that's called the log phase. It is the time, in fact, of active replication, as we'll see. When a culture becomes filled with the bacterial cells, there is apparently a signal that tells them their density is high enough, and the cells will stop dividing rapidly and go into the stationary phase. So let's take a look at bacterial cell division, and specifically when in the life of a cell does DNA get synthesized. So first of all, as you can see here, DNA is attached to the cell membrane of bacterial cells, and as the cell grows and begins binary fission, replication is already underway. And what you're looking at are two ragged-looking circles of DNA that are still attached to one another. Remember replication of bacterial circular chromosomes and the theta images? Well, you're kind of looking at that in a, in a cartoon of a living cell here. During the log phase, partially replicated DNA is itself already beginning to replicate, and so what you see as these two cells have divided, it, there is already part of a new chromosome attached to the original chromosome in these cells. And this has begun to happen even before the cells divided. So in the log phase of growth of bacterial cells, daughter cell DNA replication is well underway before the daughter cells actually separate by binary fission. This is in a stark contrast to what happens in the cells of higher organisms, namely eukaryotes. In these cells, replication and cell division are separated in time and space. In other words, DNA synthesis occurs at one point, the cells divide at another time. Here are some very early observations in working out the eukaryotic cell cycle. So what you see is a circle representing, from any one point to another, the generation of new cells. The top part is mitosis and cytokinesis, sometimes referred to as the M and C phases of the cell cycle. You may recall the phases of mitosis as prophase, that's P, metaphase, that's M, anaphase, that's A, and telophase, that's T in the illustration here. That's a very short time in the life of a cell. Most of the rest of the time of a eukaryotic cell is spent in interphase, meaning the phase between successive mitoses. And the simple microscope observation by very patient observers showed that mitosis and cytokinesis last about one to two hours for cells that might have a 15 or 60 to 24 hour doubling time. Let's continue to work out the cell cycle in an experimental way. Here we have some cells in culture. We imagine that some are in mitosis. That's the one with the little red cartoon of a spindle fiber. And other cells are not. And if you take such cells at any time from a non-synchronous culture and uh, incubate them for a short time with a precursor to DNA, in this case, tritiated thymine, remember thymine is part of the nucleotide that is incorporated into DNA exclusively, Tritiated thymine is radioactive, and so if it is taken up by cells, the cells will become radioactive, and specifically the DNA will become radioactive, won't it? So we can spread these cells on a glass slide and look at them in the microscope. It's not to scale here, of course, but if you look, you can really see that very few cells of all of them on the slide are in mitosis, actually show what's called a mitotic figure, meaning show a mitotic spindle. Uh, about 7% of any given cell population that uh, duplicates every, say, 20 hours are going to be in mitosis. The rest are going to be pretty much in interface. Well, these are radioactive cells according to the experiment, so which of them should or should not be radioactive? 
Well, we can find out by laying a piece of film over the top of the slide and allowing some time for the radioactive thymine incorporated into DNA in the nuclei or in the spindle fibers of those cells to expose the film. So we, can, we can develop the film, develop the autoradiograph, and when you do that, I think you saw that, let's do it again. The film shows black spots, which are concentrated silver grains, right over the cells that were radioactive. And as you can see, a number of cells are indeed radioactive. If you uh, write down your observations very carefully, you will realize that the cells that made DNA, of course they made their DNA in that five minute interval during which they were exposed to the tritiated thymine, those cells are radioactive. They're the ones under the black dots in the film. But none of them were cells in mitosis. That means DNA must not be synthesized during the mitotic phase of the cell cycle, or the M slash C, mitosis and cytokinesis phases of the cell cycle. That simply means that replication must precede mitosis. Replication must occur then at some point in interphase before the beginning of mitosis, before prophase, before that P phase of mitosis. This is from your textbook. It is the phases of the cell cycle as we know them now. And I've included prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis as part of the M phase. This is not temporally to scale. The cartoon that I drew is, is closer to the times of the cell cycle shown here. So in the corner is what I just showed you, and here is a cell cycle showing how much time each phase lasts. And it's variable depending on the cell type. In fact, uh, I've, what I've drawn here, I think, is 18 to 24 hour generation time. You can get cells that grow more rapidly and cells that grow somewhat more slowly as well. So this is an average. And as you can see, mitosis and cytokinesis lasting one to two hours is the shortest period in the life of a cell. And then there are these other uh, phases, G1, also referred to as GAP1, S standing for synthesis, and G2 standing for a second gap. The S standing for synthesis is the time in which DNA is uh, replicated. Each of these phases has their unique um, events that occur during the phases, and let's take a look. In GAP1, cells grow very rapidly. Uh, organelles will duplicate. Uh, ribosomes will duplicate. Mitochondria will uh, duplicate. If it's a plant cell, of course, chloroplasts will duplicate. Lysosomes. In other words, if you're going to grow a cell, you have to have in a larger cell proportionally as many components as you would in a smaller cell. As I said, the S phase is the period of DNA synthesis. It is the time during which chromosomes or chromatin is actually duplicated, which also means that not only is DNA doubled, but you have to double the number of histones, and you also have to double the number of non-histone proteins that previously covered essentially half of the chromatin. When cells that have differentiated divide, they have a memory of how they were being regulated so that a liver cell gives rise to more liver cells and doesn't suddenly become something peculiar. It is during the S phase that the appropriate proteins that are necessary to control gene expression are actually being made. In other words, the histone proteins and the non-histone proteins, which include transcription factors that control how a cell behaves. Finally, gap two is a period of additional growth, but also preparation for mitosis. You should remember a bit about what happens in mitosis. In prophase, the chromosomes condense. In metaphase, they line up at a metaphase plate. Between prophase and metaphase, a spindle fiber has formed, made out of microtubules, and so on and so on. So in gap two, you might expect that the cell will begin to synthesize alpha and beta tubulins. We just learned about those as components of microtubules. If a cell is about to do something that requires microtubules, it should make more of them, shouldn't it? So in GAP2, you might get microtubule growth. You will get the synthesis of proteins that uh, form the kinetochore. You will get synthesis of proteins responsible for condensing chromatin into chromosomes. Name the process that characterizes a given stage, and the previous stage is going to be getting ready for that. That's, in summary, the events that occur in the different phases of the cell cycle. Now, the cell cycle is regulated. The ability of a cell to progress from one phase of the cell cycle to the next is under control. It's not uh, predestined. Entering a new cycle or a new phase of the cycle requires that the previous phase be completed in good order. This is one first clue that there are molecules and uh, factors produced 
in the cytoplasm of cells responsible for controlling whether or not a cell goes into the next phase. So here we have cells in G1 and cells in the S phase, eukaryotic cells showing their nuclei, different colors, right? We're going to fuse them. We've seen cell fusion before, so we're going to fuse them with polyethylene glycol or some other trick that we can get cells to join like this. We're going to add, again, tritiated or radioactive thymine to the fused cells. After a short period of time, we're going to spread those cells on a slide and we're going to make autoradiographs just as we did before. And when you look at the developed film, what you're going to see or what people saw was that both nuclei contain newly synthesized DNA, meaning both nuclei underwent replication. Now you would expect that to happen in the blue nucleus, which was from a cell that was already in the S phase. You would not necessarily expect that to be true of a cell in G1, which is prior to the S phase. And yet, the G1 nucleus is making DNA. So you would conclude from this kind of experiment that there must be some factor, there must be some regulatory molecule, assume that it's a protein and you would be correct. There must be some S phase protein factor that is responsible for causing or inducing the nucleus of the G1 cell to start replicating its DNA prematurely, that is, before it has reached the appropriate time to do so. The regulation of the cell cycle or progress through the cell cycle occurs at several specific times during the cycle, which we call checkpoints. You will see that the cell cycle is regulated just prior, for example, to entering mitosis. It is regulated just prior to entering the S phase, the DNA synthesis phase, and so on. And these uh, checkpoints or regulatory points are there to ensure that the cell, as I pointed out a moment ago, has completed the previous phase without untoward incident. We're going to see that the factors that regulate the cell cycle at these checkpoints are largely protein kinases. Recall that many events in the life of a cell at any time are regulated by the phosphorylation or dephosphorylation of proteins, enzymes, chromatin proteins, and so on. Well, it is protein kinases which catalyze the phosphorylation of proteins that control cell cycle events that are the, the watchdogs of whether a cell will go into the next phase or not. Time permitting, we will uh, look at how cells exit the cell cycle. As you may recall, most mature cells in your body, most terminally differentiated cells in your body, no longer divide. Notably, your nerve cells don't divide, but your blood cells don't divide, liver cells generally don't divide. What does divide and thereby replace aging cells are, of course, adult stem cells. So for most tissues in your body, you have a source of stem cells that replenishes those mature cells which have a finite lifetime. A perfect example is your bone marrow, which is the source of stem cells that produce white blood cells and uh, erythrocytes, red blood cells. Those red blood cells and white blood cells themselves don't replicate. Um, they are mature cells. And then, of course, all of the cells of tissues and organs that are fully differentiated also don't divide and are replaced by stem. Just a second ago, I said that uh, cells die. They have to be replaced. They don't live forever. But what happens when they die? They undergo something called apoptosis. That is a term that describes programmed cell death. If we have time again, we will talk a little bit about apoptosis. We know something about what controls apoptosis. A good example, by the way, of apoptosis would be the tadpole that metamorphoses into a frog. You know that the tadpole grows new limbs and it grows genitalia, uh, gonads. What it loses is its tail. Well, the tail doesn't just fall off and then decay in the water. The cells of the tadpole tail undergo apoptosis. And the result is that the components are recycled. Proteins are broken down to amino acids. DNA is broken down to nucleotides and uh, bases. RNA is broken down into nucleotides and bases. All of the cell contents are appropriately hydrolyzed. The macromolecules are hydrolyzed and the component monomers recycled to make a grown-up frog. That is the function of controlling cell death, to have a programmed cell death. When cells die because they have been wounded, neglected, if you will, we say that they've undergone necrosis. And your textbook has an interesting discussion of the difference between 
apoptosis and necrosis, and I urge you to read it even if we don't have time to spend on discussing apoptosis. And that brings us to the end of this module.